Hello, hello. Hi, Corinna. Hi. Hi, hi. Hi, everybody. Hi, hi. So thanks for coming out for this nervous system care series. And today we have Corinna May, who's a link leader voice teacher and also Feldenkrais teacher, or you probably have your way of saying that part. <laughs> um, and we are going to be looking at the voice blueprint for a resilient voice. And I have studied with Corinna online uh, and she's really supported me with finding my voice. Of course, it's a continuous process, but even this whole thing of me being on Facebook Live and YouTube Live was very much synergistic with connecting with Corinna and working with her via these processes. And today is also a little bit of a, a taste of her work to, to invite you to her self-paced online course called Voice, Breath, and Creativity, which is on sale for 40% off through Friday. And if you're watching this uh, replay later, the link will be underneath the video somewhere and you can learn more about her series. And just the, I was reading through the reviews of it this morning and it's just like incredible life-changing experiences that people had. Um, so I'm looking forward to today. Thank you so much. And I will pass it on to you, Corinna. Hi, thank you for that, Tiffany. I'm, I'm very flattered that, because, you know, I, I started out in this business, this business, I started out in the world as an actor. I arrived here today by starting as an actor when I was, when I was a young thing. And one of the things I learned as an actor was never to read my reviews. So, <laughs> so I'm really, I, 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 I'm immediately sort of discombobulated and moved that people um, felt that it was, it was deeply useful to them. Uh, I am a Linklater voice teacher, and Kristen Linklater, whom uh, the author of this work, actually uh, left the world about six or so weeks ago, and uh, she called her work the Linklater Method or Freeing the Natural Voice. And her work came from uh, a, a tradition of elocution and creating the voice beautiful um, that was largely carried in the middle of the sort of the late 19th and early 20th into the middle 20th century by a woman named Iris Warren. And the distinction that Iris Warren brings uh, to the world of voice is actually she sort of revolutionized voice teaching. And here's how she did it. In the, in the early days, it was about projection, being heard in the back row of the theater, clarity of utterance, clarity of articulation. And uh, the voice was pretty much thought of as, you know, a musical instrument that you could sort of manipulate into certain sounds and certain emotions and certain, you know, to be an expert player of your voice. And, uh, and th then... You know, Iris worked a lot. She was working a lot with actors who'd come to her and their voices were strained and their voices were tired and she'd sort of do her thing. And then one day, legend has it, a psychiatrist friend of hers called her and said, I am having a lot of trouble with patients of mine who are uh, uh, unable to get their their voices out, who are unable to tell their stories in my room. They're unable to speak about their traumatic experiences or whatever it was. So Iris came in, got the patient to relax, got the patient to breathe deeply because she knew all about breath, get him to feel the sound of his voice in his body. And he began, this patient began weeping and floods of tears came out. And with the flood of tears came a flood of words. And Iris made the connection about the freeing of the emotion, the freeing of the breath, freeing the voice, and that the voice was intimately connected with the emotional life. And she took th this into her work with actors, began adapting her voice work with actors to include the emotional world and then the imaginative world. And Kristen really developed the work into... Um, into including the wide landscape of the imagination, which which we all have. I mean, actors use it as as part of their stock in trade, but we all have a, a, a an alive 
imagination. Uh, so Kristen's work is now called Art and Imagery in Breath and Language. All right, the exploration. And what I'm going to do with you today is, is play with your voice, your breath, and there's going to be a lot of, of imagery in that. All right. So um, the voice of resilience, you know, if you've ever heard a baby cry, you've probably noticed that they don't lose their voices, that they, they can cry and cry and cry and their voices stay strong. And then as we grow and we're civilized, our voices get acculturated into being held, into being shaped, into being protective, into being smaller. And particularly in, in these times, we are being challenged as humans on many, many, many levels. And I'm sure you're being challenged on many levels, on many fronts, on the macro level and on the, on the micro level and on the macro level. And now more than ever, we need resilient voices. And uh, that voice, that word resilient keeps coming to me. How can your voice be resilient? How can it be toned? And then when Tiffany invited me to come in and speak to you and, 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 and do some, some work with you and talked about the nervous system, and, and I've been very interested recently in the polyvagal theory and how the voice, using the voice, singing, speaking, laughing, uh, crying, sighing, how using the voice tones the whole vagal system. So we're going to play with some breathing and some humming today and, and tone your vagal systems up a bit. Um, I'd like to actually ask you a couple of questions before I, I take you into the, the process itself. When does your voice feel free? And you might think of a what might come to you as a specific instance. And could you um, just write a few words in the chat if you if you feel like it? When does your voice feel free? And it might be I don't know with your best friend, laughing over a cup of tea or talking to my children. Yeah, for some people, talking to the dog. Yeah. Like what are the environments? What are the what are the when you feel safe? Yeah, and then you might even take that a little further and go, well, when do I feel when do I feel safe? Is it with my loved ones? Is it when everything connects? And again, you think, wow, for me personally, what is that? What is that sensation? What is that environment? Singing in the car. Yeah. For some of us, it's singing in the shower, right? Yeah. After movement. After movement how the voice is deeply connected and of the self. Yeah, playing guitar and singing. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. At the top of a mountain, I often do a big holler. I love that. <laughs> yeah. So here's another question. Yeah, screaming with joy. Roller coasters. People's voices get so free. Yeah, when I speak to my friend, my horses. Lovely. So here's another question. When does your voice feel constrained? When does your voice feel like it curls up like a little snail in its shell? Or when does it feel as though your voice isn't free? Oh, I love all these freedom answers. I'm sorry to take you into the not freedom place. When does your voice feel constrained? Or when does it, when do you, maybe, maybe there are places where you stop your voice, right? For me, it was often, um, when I was in the presence of my grandmother, with whom I, I could almost never be ladylike enough <laughs> when I have a fear of being judged. Yeah. Yeah. When I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. When I'm passionate. How is it that sometimes being super passionate, the brakes come on? When I'm trying not to cry. Yeah, that's a big one. Public speaking, a both both free and constrained. Yes, how do we manage when I have a fear of hurting others, of causing conflict, of creating problems? Mm -hmm. When I feel uncomfortable with I'm struggling with what to say. So it's interesting. And I bet as you're typing these things into the chat, your body is telling you, your body is telling you when I'm, when I'm crying exactly then <laughs> that, that, 
the voice is designed to be free and open and then we and then as we get as uh, as we become civilized which is appropriate it is appropriate to become civilized we start to manage we start to put in habits of stopping the breath stopping the voice and often they're they're not very subtle and nuanced and they're not very nuanced yeah and what would it be like to feel all of these things and be able to speak what would it be like to be able to feel these things and still to be able to speak to take some of these habits that constrain our spontaneity that constrain the freedom of our voice because you're a grown up you can choose now what to say right but for instance if when you feel angry you feel your voice seizes up that's probably an old coping mechanism that got wired into place a long time ago and what would it be like for your voice to be free and you to be able to choose to express however much of your anger you want to or however little of your anger you want to but not have it stop your voice so we're going to go all the way to a fundamental principle of freeing the voice and that is to free the body and breath I'm going to give you one more question and again answer uh, as you wish or uh, whether you want to or, or you may not wish to answer this but could you put in the chat if you wish or just think to yourself three words three single words connected or not connected to each other from the landscape of your voice or the story of your voice So for me, it would be permission, joy, self-consciousness. Those are three words in the, and they may have to do with your family or... Yeah, and that's a, that's a rather a more difficult question to answer, perhaps. Yeah, warm, resonant, necessary. Necessary. What a word. Necessary. Yeah, connection, truth, freedom. And, and somewhere in you is, is, a, is a knowing of that, that feeling. Yeah, these images are beautiful. Knots, volcano kindness deep caught into aware into released innocence mm -hmm. yeah so taking these thoughts that are swirling around home i love that Thich Nhat han says that i arrive i am home what is it about being in your voice it feels like being home lovely lovely so um could you now, you can either sit or you can stand, and then in a moment I'm going to invite you to lie down on the floor, although if you prefer to do this lesson sitting, you're free to do this lesson sitting. Could you find either a fragment or a, of a poem or a piece of a speech, or it could be a nursery rhyme or the lyrics of a song, just a fragment of text that you could speak that it would give you pleasure to speak and use this as kind of a before snapshot. So for me, these lines from Shakespeare have been swirling around in my head. I know a bank where the wild thyme blows, where ox lips and the nodding violet grows. There sleeps Titania sometime of the night. So two or three lines that you could speak. Lovely. And then would you please make yourself comfortable either lying on your back or sitting in your chair? And lying on your back, you can have your legs long and your arms down by your sides. 
And if at any point that becomes uncomfortable and you'd like to bend your knees and have your feet standing, please attend to your own comfort at all times. Be self-regulating. And notice what it's like lying on the floor. Checking into yourself. And when I invite you to pay attention, to check into yourself, where does your attention go? Where does your awareness go? Are there familiar places that your attention goes? Favorite places your attention visits? Maybe it's how your pelvis is lying or your ribs or your feet. Maybe it's your breathing. Maybe it's the thoughts that might be swirling through your head. Maybe it's a general wash of, oh, yes, here I am lying on the floor. Maybe there's some relief in lying on the floor. And could you allow that feeling of relief to, to create an actual sigh of relief just on breath? <sighs> Pleasurable relief. And then could you send your mind's eye all the way down to your feet? And as if your mind's eye could see how your feet are there on the floor, and as if your mind's eye could travel around the bones of your feet. And you might want to curl your toes a bit or slide your heels a bit or move your feet around a bit on the floor and how little kids play with their feet a lot. In whatever that way that feels pleasurable, as if your feet are your feet are saying hello to the floor and the floor is saying hello to your feet and you're saying hello to your feet. And then let the let that playing fall away softly. And then could you now picture all the joints of your feet? Small joints, intricate joints. And could you imagine that your breath could go swirling into? all the joints of your feet and your toes. Creating a little more space. And then could you picture your ankle joints and picture space in your ankle joints. And imagine that your breath could swirl into that space, the spaces of your ankle joints. And create more space more freedom and ease and then letting your mind's eye travel up into your lower legs and thinking into your calf muscles and allowing the muscles of your calves your calf muscles to soften and widen and warm and melt hard working calf muscles allowing a little more softness as if they could drop a little bit away from the bones and picture then your knee joints. Picture space in your knee joints and as if your breath could swirl in and swirl around and create even more spaciousness in your knee joints. And picture the great muscles of your thighs and allow the muscles of your thighs to soften and warm and release a little bit away from the bones. Drop towards the floor. And then let your mind's eye travel into your hip joints, your hip sockets, and picture space in your hip sockets and picture your breath swirling into that space. And then let your awareness travel around the spaces of your pelvis, letting the muscles soften and warm letting your breath swirl and play in the cradle of your pelvis. And allowing the muscles of your buttocks and the deep abdominal, abdominal muscles to soften and warm. And then letting your mind's eye travel to the very base of your spine and picture your tailbone, your vestigial tail. and the sacrum above the tailbone. Mm -hmm. 
and picturing the vertebrae of your spine, allowing the muscles around your spine to soften so that each vertebra could drop a little closer to the floor and then let your mind's eye travel on up your spine. And could you, between each vertebra, put a cushion of air so there's a bit of buoyancy between each vertebra, as if your breath could actually go in and swirl around in these spaces and create these cushions. As you travel on up your spine, at some point you'll see your ribs branching out, allowing the muscles around the ribs to soften, allowing your breath to swirl into the joints, creating buoyancy. As you continue to travel up your spine, you come to your upper spine, you'll see the, the plates of your shoulder blades, allowing the muscles around the shoulder blades to soften, the shoulders to shoulder blades to soften and melt. You might even think that the space between your shoulder blades could get a little wider because your breath is coming in and creating more ease and space. And then continuing up your spine to where you see your, it curving away from the floor, what you call the neck, and allowing there to be space, to be air between each vertebra of your cervical spine, your neck spine, and at the very top of your spine, letting there be a little breath of air, a cushion of air, a swirling of air between the topmost vertebra and your skull. Ease, finding ease, letting your imagination allow your breath to create more ease. And then coming back to your shoulders and finding the shoulder girdle and traveling on out and finding your shoulder sockets, letting your mind's eye see your shoulder sockets and, and imagining that your breath could swirl into your shoulder sockets and create more space, more ease, more freedom. And letting your mind's eye travel down, your upper arms softening and melting a little bit, letting your breath swirl into your elbow joints, allowing your mind's eye to soften the muscles of your forearms. Picture your wrist joints, picture space, picture your breath swirling and eddying around in your wrist joints, creating more space. Picture the bones of your hands your fingers, your thumbs, allowing your breath to swirl into all those joints, all those spaces, so your breath can inhabit all of you. And getting a little more sense of lightness, of ease. And then your attention sweeps back up your arms, sweeps across your shoulders, and sweeps through the whole of you. And you picture yourself lying there on the floor, united by your breath, softened by your breath, inhabited by your breath. And be aware of your breathing and how your breath moves you. And just for a moment, let your awareness come into your mouth and notice what your tongue seems to be doing. And can your tongue be lying quietly in the bed of your jaw? And you might feel a sense of breath traveling through your nose and down your throat. Can there be space between your top teeth and your bottom teeth? And just for a moment, letting your tongue uh, press gently up into the roof of your mouth and letting it come back to rest in the bed of your jaw. And a few more times, just in your own time, very, very gently, very softly, very sort of in an exploratory way. Just press your tongue gently, like you're exploring a bit the real estate of your hard palate of the roof of your mouth, that dome-like structure. And let it soften down maybe three or four times. And then press your tongue a little bit into the uh, bottom of your jaw, the bed of your jaw. 
Very gently, very gently. Just a little press down and release. We'll press down, the sides of the tongue can engage with the inner bottom teeth. And release just a few times. Oh yeah, there's the bottom of my jaw, huh? That's my tongue resting and pressing. And then a few times, could you allow, bring your tongue up to hover somewhere in the middle space of your mouth, as if it was one of those Star Wars crafts or an eagle sailing on the thermals. And release down just two or three or four times. Let it hover. Feel what that's like. Let your breathing continue uninterrupted and then let it rest. Good. Let there be space between your top teeth and your bottom teeth, particularly in the back. And then gently bring your teeth together and feel, does that do anything to your breathing? Did it interrupt or interfere in any way? And then let your teeth gently come apart. And keep your lips together and then gently let them come apart and together a few more times. Gently together, gently release them apart. Gently together, gently release them apart. Does that do anything to your breathing? And then allow yourself a very pleasurable yawn and stretch and yawn in some breath. <gasps> and come back to yourself. And again, a, a, a pleasurable sigh of relief. Let it come in and wash out of you just on breath. <sighs> like a dog flopping under a tree on a hot day. And then turn your attention back to your middle and the easy coming and going of your breath. And take a moment to observe the natural rhythm of your breathing. And that the natural rhythm of your breathing has everything to do with your experience as a human in this moment. So letting your breath be easy, letting it come and go as it pleases, having no opinion about what's correct, having no opinion about whether or not you are breathing correctly, simply allowing the natural rhythm of your breathing in this moment, and it'll be slightly different for each of you, or maybe vastly different. And you can drop a hand onto your belly, one or two hands onto your belly to feel the movement, where you feel movement. You might be move your hands softly, curiously in different places, your ribs, your, your belly, your upper, uh, your chest, sort of different parts of your ribs, side ribs, back ribs. Just to be curious, listening hands. Where do you feel movement? And then bring your hands back to rest on your belly, one hand or two hands. And let the natural rhythm of your breathing establish. Let it tell you what it wants. One of my teachers, Michael Krugman, said, make no attempt to breathe deeply or any special way. Let your breath come, let it go. So you don't have to breathe in, you simply allow the breath to show up, you allow it to arrive. And you don't have to consciously breathe out, you simply allow the breath to depart. In fact, you open the channels and the breath comes and goes. So give yourself the impulse for a yawn, feel how that organically widens your throat. And when your throat is open, when your teeth have some space between them, when the channels are open, your breath comes and your breath goes. And the natural rhythm of breathing also, it, it contains release and it contains relaxation. So there are two moments. You can think of two moments of relaxation, two moments of relief. One is all the muscles deep inside of you, of your belly, soften and yield to the need for breath and the breath comes in. And then there's a second moment of relaxation and release as the breath is released out. 
And then after the breath leaves you, there might be a tiny pause, there might not be. It's a moment of, of almost of waiting. And you feel there's a felt need for breath and again the breath comes in, it replaces. So there's a moment of relaxation to allow the breath in and there's a moment of relaxation to release the breath out. And that the natural rhythm of breathing is not necessarily deep, it's not necessarily even. Some breaths are deep, some breaths are not so deep. Some breaths are long, some breaths are short, some breaths are medium size. Letting your breath come and go of its own accord. And now, because in speaking, allowing the breath to come and go through your lips allows for more immediacy and spontaneity. So could you practice now letting your lips be gently parted and letting your breath come and go through your gently parted lips? The blueprint, breath is the blueprint for speaking. So in speaking, we often are inspired. The breath comes in through the mouth. We can get a much more immediate, much larger impulse of breath through the mouth when we need to speak, particularly when we're passionate about something. So letting your lips be gently parted. Feeling that as the breath comes in, you're, there's a sense of expansion, perhaps a sense of your belly rising. And that there's a caress of air on your lips as the breath comes in and as the breath releases out. And if you lick your lips, you can increase the sensation of cool air coming in and warm air releasing out. Letting your jaw, lower jaw, drop away from your top jaw. So the cool air comes in over your lips. It drops down to your middle. It arrives wherever it happens to arrive. And then warm air washes out. And this warm air that washes out, it is infused. It is informed by you. So when does the breath become your breath? And can you think that as, that the, that the, as the air, as the world, as life outside of me comes into me in the form of a breath, then I wash out to the world in the form of a breath. I release out to the world. You and your breath are one and the same. And because your breath is an expression of you, Moshe Feldenkrais said, your breathing reflects every emotional and physical effort, every disturbance, every nuance, Kristen talked about how your breath reveals what you're thinking and feeling. Someone who loves you can tell simply from your sigh how you're thinking and feeling. If there's a willingness to release, you can also disguise that. That that you, know, you can control it. You can disguise it. But what if you take the controls off and let your breath be as revealing as the breath of a child? And being interested in your natural rhythm of breathing being something like a tiny, contented, pleasurable sigh of relief. So each breath is a tiny, contented sigh of relief. So that what you're building in is this idea that it's a relief to speak. You are relieved by speaking. And now I'm going to invite you to make a bit of a leap. And that is to allow this release of you on breath to become more tangible, more physical. To allow yourself to release just as simply on vibration. Huh. Huh. So it's a simple, uninflected, little bit of raw sound. Huh. From inside to outside. Uh, it's not shaped by your mouth. Your lower jaw drops away. Uh, it's not shaped by your tongue. Uh, and releasing what we call these, the touch of sound. Uh, 
a simple expression of you in this moment from inside to outside. Huh. And when I say it's not shaped, what I mean is you're not deliberately shaping it with your muscles, but it contains what you're thinking and feeling. So each one is an individual moment. Huh. So if I suddenly start thinking of my to-do list, huh, <laughs> that might come into my voice. If I think about that I'm going to get to see a friend later, socially distancing, huh. If I think about something that gives me pleasure, huh. So I don't have to make my voice sound a particular way. I simply allow an un untrammeled, uninterfered with, unmanipulated expression of me. Huh. And now taking another leap of faith, you're going to allow a sigh of vibrational relief. Huh. The impulse for relief brings the breath washing into you and relief washing out of you like a river. Ha ah. And you can feel that relief can travel along your bones. Vibrations can travel along your bones. And it's embodied and embodied release of you through relief. Ha ah. And now you're going to sigh this river of relief and you're going to trap it on your lips. Um, and that relief, it's as if a river suddenly encountered a set of gates and the, and the relief, the vibrational river of relief starts to pile up behind the gates and you feel there's vibration arriving on your lips. Um, keep letting your teeth be separate. Letting that impulse of relief gather on your lips. And if you want to, you can bring your finger fingertips gently to your lips and you'll feel that the relief, the vibrational relief transfers from your lips to your fingers. Um, and you might feel vibrational relief buzzing around in your head. You might feel it buzzing around in your chest. Where do you feel vibrations? Where do you imagine you feel vibrations? Um, and then in an even greater leap of faith, you're going to sigh that hum from your middle, catch it on your lips, let the vibrations gather and multiply, and then you're going to part your lips and the vibrations are going to fly out of you as if the river was suddenly allowed to continue on its course. I'll go first. It'll be something like this, but your version. Hum. Uh. And then you can either continue simply with the with gathering the hum, just the humming. You can play with the humming and releasing. And I'm going to invite you to play with different pitches, different frequencies of energy. So you might want to go low. Hum. You might want to go a little higher. Hum. Uh, hum. You might want to play through pitches. Um, uh, um, uh. Each time, though, taking the time to have the impulse to release this pleasurable sigh. Feel that the impulse brings the breath in. You are inspired. The breath comes in. The sound washes to your lips. If your lips open, the sound washes out into the room. Take the time. Hum. Let your tongue rest in the bed of your jaw. Let your teeth be separated. Hum. After the hum is complete, take a moment for your breath to replace. So you don't have to breathe in. You simply invite all the muscles in your middle to soften and you open the channel. If you might want to think a little bit of a yawn in your throat to help open the channel. Um, allow your lips to part. 
Feel yourself inspired. Feel the breath come into you. Um, uh. And now we're going to make an even greater le leap. And that is, could you feel inspired to speak that piece of text that you were speaking in the beginning and feel that that need to speak it, the need to feel that, the need to put that out in the world, brings the breath in and the sound sighs out of you and actually do it as an actual sigh so it'll feel maybe a little odd. I know a bank where the wild time blows. And whenever you need a new breath, you allow yourself to be inspired by the breath. You soften down below and invite, yield to the need. Where ox lips and the nodding violet blows and you might allow a breath every couple or three words however your thought whatever your thought is a thought is not a complete sentence a complete sentence is grammar a thought is a thought you might think a yawn if your throat is starting to feel a little constrained you might think of a yawn yawning the breath in there sleeps titania sometime of the night And whenever you've spoken your words, you can come back to the natural rhythm of breathing. But just because you're not speaking doesn't mean there still isn't willingness, thought, feeling, expression of experience coming through your breath. When your breath is free, your sound can be free. Freedom of breath, freedom of sound, freedom of voice, freedom of you will create more and more resilience. And then gently roll yourself over to one side, come up to sitting. And if you like, when you come up to standing, you can stand easily and speak your text again and see what it's like now in standing. Or see what it's like to sit in your chair and speak it in sitting. Not trying to do anything special, but to feel. I am inspired, I speak. My breath comes in, it ignites. Or my need to communicate ignites my breath coming in. And, my, and it's a relief to speak my truth. It is a relief to speak my text. It is a relief to make myself known in the world through my vibration. And if you care to share in the chat any words about how you're feeling now or what that experience was like, anything, as Kristen says, fresh, new, or interesting. <laughs> Start a melody and joy comes. Ah, oh, joy. What a thing it is. You know, it's interesting how we think about our, uh, I think a lot of people think about anger as being stifled, but think about how often joy gets stifled as well. And that having free access to our joy is part of our birthright to relief. It is a relief. And what if every moment of speaking could be a relief, joyful relief, ecstatic relief? Simple relief. I thought my words fall, flow out more naturally and easily. Soft and words streaming out of my mouth. Ease. Special. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a famous quotation of Martha Graham talking to Agnes DeMille about you have one expression that comes through you. You are a channel. Softly smiling, smiling eyes. Yeah, alive. Speaking after the surprisingly non-habitual. Great, I love that. All right, that that brings us to our I'm, the close of this. I'm 
So grateful to you for coming and spending this time with yourself and with me. I, one of the reasons I do this work is because as I invite you into your inspiration and relief, it helps me to uh, to re renew and refresh my inspiration and relief. So thank you so very much and um, go forth and vibrate. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Corinna. What a relief. I just kept <laughs> wanting I just kept wanting to say that <laughs> after the, the words relief just felt like they came through really smoothly. Thank you. Yeah. I remember the whole sonnet somebody says, great. And you might feel your emotional life is free is 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 just flowing more easily and spontaneously now as well. I'm seeing Tiffany that your eyes are so soft. Hmm. Um and, and that your voice just feels easy and effortless. So, yeah. And in terms of thinking about the the vagus nerve and the and the social nervous system and this thing about being safe in the world, and it has so much to do with also my feeling of can I express myself? Can I say yes? Can I say no? Can I just be in my own skin and also have a voice in relationship to the world? And when I feel that I can, that that channel is open, then I feel more safe, more resilient. And it's a, it's a loop, right? So the feedback that I get from my own experience of my own voice and breath creates a, more of a feeling of safety. And then, you know, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, Tiffany. And that... A lot, and that often we've lo you know we've lost that feeling of of vibration we've lost that that sensory pleasure in speaking and to re you know to invite that if it can be a relief it can be if it can start with pleasure and relief right and and then then i think we'll play with it m more and more and it will invite that opening. But the idea of the feedback loop, that, that when I feel I have agency, when I feel my voice is available to serve me, um, yeah. And then you just find yourself spontaneously speaking up more and more. Yeah, yeah that absolutely. was the, when I was hearing you talk, I was thinking about spontaneity. And that was one of the things that I talked about in the early nervous system care sessions that this freedom of the voice has such a, it's so intimately linked with my feeling of being able to be spontaneous and trusting those spontaneous impulses that come, that there's less inhibition on that spontaneity. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And what Kristen would talk about is, and you know, she died, but I speak of her in the first person because she's still, you know, with me and through me. She's as elemental as the wind for me, mm -hmm. that, that, we want to take the controls off. We want to take the sort of, for lack of a better word, the the the, the interfering sort of uh, clumsier muscular controls off. That the kind of the spun the, the 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 inhibition comes in, that comes in the managing that comes in. We want to let that go away, and and because people think, oh, well, I don't want my voice to be too spontaneous because of, what if I'm a raging id in my next meeting? But you want the you, you still want there to be controls, but you want them to be the finer, more nuanced controls of choice, right? So I have a thought. Mm, I think I'll choose to speak in a more measured way instead of, you know, instead of letting the lid come off the volcano right now. But I haven't just automatically, thoughtlessly shut the volcano down. And I might find, yeah, there are times when I really want to let it out. And there are times when I, I want it to be more nuanced, right? But I, it's going to be my decision, my choice, rather than I, I have no choice when I get angry, I can't let my voice out. Mm -hmm. So pleasure, relief, agency. And choice. Mm -hmm. And choice. Mm -hmm. and choice. When your voice is free, you have choices. You have choices mm -hmm. and you can go mm -hmm. forth and vibrate and, 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 and do what you want. Wow. Nice. Okay. And would you say a little bit about your series, the voice, breath and creativity series? There's a few, yes. few months back. Yes. Yeah. 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 
that that it 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 what it what it is it, i include there are there are um feldenkrais lessons there are link later lessons on um, my my interest my curiosity my life's work right now i guess is is weaving these two uh powerful methods together and the series just starts with the very beginning. Kristen Linklater's uh, method is a progression of exercises that are designed to take you from awareness, physical awareness, through breath awareness, through this initial touch of sound, increasing vibrations, freeing the channel, the jaw, lips, the tongue, the soft palate, increasing resonance, increasing range, and then finally into articulation. So in the voice, breath, and creativity, we start to explore the very, the foundation of the progression, the foundation of the Linklater method. Can you, can you find more freedom in your body, more freedom in your breath in order to create more freedom in your sound? And how the voice is so intimately linked to our ability, to our, to the possibility of being creative in the world. Mm. Um, yeah. You've been through it, Tiffany. Did you want to say anything else about well, it? Well, I, I pulled up these words because they're so poignant. This musician who spoke, wrote about his experience, and you can read it more on the, on the page, movementandcreativity.com backslash voice. But he said, I've spent, the short of it is, I've spent thousands of dollars on voice training over the years, but nothing has helped me half as much as the past four weeks, which is just... It's just incredible, incredible. And this like freedom, I think that the way that the way that you're bringing together the link later and the the Feldenkrais is it's like it's not like we're doing some kind of fixing or some kind of job or technique on ourselves, but it's like with Feldenkrais that you are entering into an experience and experimenting with these different options and then the freedom shows up and spontaneously in unexpected ways. Um, so, yeah. yeah, I would definitely that, that we are, that we start with the assumption that everyone possesses a free voice, that more, more, you know, more or less everyone is born with a, with a, a, a three to four octave range capable of expressing the entire gamut of human emotion, every nuance of thought, intellectual argument, feeling, and then we get acculturated into being smaller. So what we're actually doing is not creating a voice, like your voice should sound like this. What we're doing is, is freeing your voice. We want to hear you through your voice. We want to hear you. So it's, it's, it's more about undoing. Yes, we have exercises for strengthening, increasing resonance, increasing range and suppleness and agility, but it's about you. It's about you. There was a question. I'm feeling like this could help support creative flow in writing and art as well. Is that your experience? Yeah, my experience is for me directly is when my voice is free, my thought is free, and my imagination is free. I When I first started doing the Linklater work, uh, particularly I remember when I was training, because we, we train for 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 at least three years, I trained for about ten years because I kept going off and doing my my acting work as well with Kristen. I remember being in our designation workshop, which is six weeks with Kristen and a couple other master teachers going through the paces. And I said, you know what? I just don't. You know, you use all these beautiful images, and I hear them, but I don't think of myself as a person who has images. I don't think of myself as a person who has a particularly free imagination. And then a day later. We were doing something with with ribs and spine and standing, and I suddenly had this image of my ribs. We'd been doing some. Uh, she'd just taken us through a forty five minute warm up, and I saw my ribs as the branches of this great tree with sunlight pouring through the leaves, and I, I was astonished, and I, you know, it's as if she had, rest she had restored to me in that moment through this work, something that had always been there. So yes, and I am a writer as well as a performing artist. And so yes, 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 yes to all of them. And there's actually a drawing process that we do in the in the movement and creativity series. So yeah. yes to all of that. 
Yay. I really appreciated this comment. Thanks for this offer of liberation. Yeah, you're very welcome. Mm. It's entirely my pleasure. And so I'm moving to hear of that because I think of you as someone so rich with imagery and imagination. So that's amazing to hear of that yeah. beginning of yeah. unveiling, unleashing that part of you that was always there. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, so much. thank you. Thank you. To be continued. And we have plans of a part two, um, maybe in the fall. So the part one would be a prerequisite for the part two. So you could yeah. catch up via the self-paced series and then join in with the live series um, with the part two, if you'd like. And if you're watching this later and you have comments or questions, please leave them for us and we'll please answer do, them yeah. and get back to you. And yeah, thanks, yeah. Corinna. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the joy. It's such a pleasure. All mm -hmm. right. I hope we meet again. Until we meet again. Okay. okay. Bye. Bye.